Hi, and welcome to the Psych Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Jason Van Shee, and I'm one of the hosts of the show. The aim of the podcast is to rapidly increase the knowledge and application of psychological health and safety in workplaces worldwide. To help with this, we have regular guests from around the world who are leading the way in this important area. But before I introduce our guest and topic for today, allow me to introduce my co-host, Joelle Mitchell. How are you today, Joelle? Good, Jason. It's Nacho Friday. What's not to be happy about? That's right. So um, if we cut this podcast short with our guests, it's because yeah. we've heard the nachos arrive. Listeners, you'll know what happened. Nachos before all else. <laughs> yes, it is right up there. Um, is that is that your highlight of your week, Nacho Friday? I actually went to drinks last night with... Um, so my cousin works at my previous employer and she's leaving. So she was having her farewell drinks, but she's actually leaving the state. Um, so I thought I'd go and um, catch up with some people. So that was nice. And um, one of the ladies there actually listens to our podcast. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is she uh, ex-colleague? She is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so um, her feedback was, Jason seems lovely. <laughs> What do they know? <laughs> I know, right? Well, that's misleading. <laughs> so were there any, any investment bankers there last night? No. Yeah, okay. That's, that's Well, a- may, I mean, maybe, but not that I was aware of. So that that's fine. Okay, because that's usually the pickup line, isn't it? Jason seems lovely. No, I'm an investment banker. That was one time. It <laughs> <laughs> happened to me one time and you just like, you like. Hey, you, it comes up a lot, like. Does it? Maybe you weren't you hit bring, on that much. You bring it up pumps. a lot. I told you about it once and then you're the one that keeps bringing it up. Anyway, I'm glad you weren't hit on last night, Joel. Thank you, Jason. By an investment banker. I least, wasn't hit on so. by anybody because okay. they were all ex-colleagues, so that would have yeah. been very inappropriate Yeah. Um, for a number of reasons, um, not least of all because they all know that I'm married. So, yeah. 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 Um, but no, it was nice, nice <laughs> to see people that I haven't seen all year. And, yeah. Um, have have a bit of a catch up. So yeah. And hopefully good. we'll beat that experience with Nacho Fridays today. Maybe. Hanging out with the. I have of- to get pretty drunk. Yeah. Yeah. And you're on school pickup today again. Yeah. Yeah. So probably won't happen. No. no. Okay. No. So last night was probably going to be the highlight of your week then. Probably. We've got like a um an extended family photo shoot on Sunday. Which. Requires a lot of alcohol, probably. I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like luck. lots of lots of standing around and waiting, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe bring a six pack. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, someone's going to have to drive home from there as well. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who, Uber. Who Uber. Yeah. There's, Uber. A, there's an app for that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, look, we probably should. We've kept our guests waiting long. Yeah. Enough, let's move along. <laughs> okay. So, look, um, our guest today like a lot of our previous guests, is a registered psychologist with a master's degree in organisational psychology. She has a deep interest in the topic of loneliness, which will definitely be the main subject of conversation today. She founded and currently chairs the Professional Association for Asian Australian Organisational Psychologists and is the founder and CEO of Beyond Story. Welcome to the podcast, Christine Young. Hello, everyone who are tuning in. I'm Christine. Lovely to be here. I already feel we are going to have so much fun to talk about this topic. Yeah, loneliness. That's what I think of straight it's away. It's such a fun topic. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure you can make it fun, Christine. We can definitely make it fun. Yeah, yeah. now this is actually the second Flourish DX podcast you've been on in quick succession, yeah, right? Because you were on the Mentally Healthy Workplaces Asia podcast with Wen recently as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Just I think the, the episode was launched just last week, I believe, episode four. Sorry, just rub it in just to get some promotion in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, it was it was a great chat. Um, as with a lot of Wen's conversations, I believe it revolved a lot around food. Absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, you, if you listen to that podcast, you'll definitely hear food come up. And that probably should be one of the regular questions like, you know, what's your favorite food? Where do you eat? Yeah. I feel like if she started the podcast with that, they'd never actually get onto the actual podcast topic, though. That's right, because you were on the last episode, weren't you, Joelle? And it got to what, like dog, like puppies or something? We got to the end, the end of the episode, and she asked about like my holiday plans, and I mentioned my dad breeds Labradoodles down on yeah. the, on the farm, and she just like lost her mind at that point. So. Yeah, I feel like if if I'd mentioned that at the start of the episode, that would have been all all that she was able to talk about for the whole thing. So yeah. Well, we're not going to talk about that. No. No. Christine, tell yes. us about your favorite podcasts. Oh well, 
definitely is the Flourish DX podcast. Of course. <laughs> it's yeah. one of the top lists, of course. It's from professional development. I've got a list of podcasts that I listen to and definitely not lying because I'm here. Flourish DX is the top five I listen to. And my personal development, please do not judge me. I listen to Oprah. Oh, okay. The Oprah podcast that she interviews spiritual leaders, professional development leaders. So I listen to to Oprah podcasts when I was when I feel down or I feel a little bit of demotivation. Definitely going to Oprah. I'm an Oprah girl. Mm. Yeah, no, I don't mind those sort of podcasts where they bring on leaders. Um, mm. So I love the Guy Raz um, uh, ones where he, he talks to founders of tech companies. So yeah. Funnily enough. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, any that you listen to for fun, Christine? For fun? Do you listen to podcasts for fun? Sorry. Yes, I do. Yeah. Do? I do. Yeah. What do you listen to? What do you listen to? So like I like revisionist history, which is really interesting. Um, it's educational, but it's not yeah. like professional development, but it is really interesting. That's Malcolm Gladwell. Um, cautionary Tales. Um, I I mean, this is making me sound like a real nerd, right? Um, so I've, I've, I've just started listening to Literally, which is Rob Lowe's podcast, and that's very, very funny because he's so funny and he gets funny guests on. Um, and since you mentioned that on Kevin's episode, I've already listened to the Chris Pratt episode. Yeah. So thanks for putting me onto that. It's, it's so yeah. like, cause they, he, all of these guests um, he's worked with and knows really well. So um, that's a good one. Um, what else? Lots of stuff. I listen yeah, to lots I listen, of stuff. I listen to Hamish and Andy for a bit of fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah that, that is fun. That, yeah. 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 A little bit of that too. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, main, mainly nerdy ones here, but mostly, yeah. mostly nerdy. Yeah, mostly. A, a little, I, I got into the um, like the murder, um, like true crime stuff, but then um, I was having dark thoughts, so I <laughs> thought I should probably stop um, listening to stories of women getting assaulted and, and murdered. Yeah. Um, yeah, not not great, not great for the mental health. Um, let's talk about your professional career. Professional career started um, 15 years ago in psychometric testing. So all things about psych tests in recruitment, organizational development, leadership consulting space. Um, Done that for eight years, actually, for the same company. Then I did my soul searching and I left Australia to Geneva and studied with UN, United Nations. Uh, because I wanted to know what exactly happening in the world. Why terrorists become a terrorist? That kind of question. Um, so I studied there and then came back and I start Beyond Story. I thought I really wanted to contribute to community differently and people and organization differently. So I start Beyond Story. So I've been working in psych testing starting there and then Building Beyond Story Up is solely focusing on optimizing people connection at work. Hence, loneliness is my passion. And also looked at how that impact on performance and productivity. Yeah. So that's yeah. my journey. So what 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 um motivated you to found um, Beyond Story and focus on loneliness? Yeah, I think that's a really great question, Jason. Um can I share a story? Sure, that's it's- what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I came back from Geneva and one day, I remember it was a week after the, in 2014, November. Why I remember so clearly because I it was a week after the terrorist attack in Paris, if you remember. Um, I was at Botanical Garden reading a book um, and then I noticed this kid running around and it, they were quite close to me, like, I mean, the kid and the mom. And this young little boy suddenly point at this lady wearing hijab and asked the mom very loudly and asked the mom, do you think she's a terrorist? So at that moment, It's just shocked me to my core. What kind of story that we were fitting to kids? 
mm. how we condition them. That's why the name of my business is called Beyond Story. So how do we look beyond what socially constructed narrative in our head and really find our identity and who we really are? So hence Beyond Story and hence that that's motivate me. It's actually for our next generation. Yeah, that's um, fascinating and a really great cause. Um, you also have founded um, the Australian, uh, uh, sorry, the Asian Australian Organizational Psychologists Inc. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, how did that um, get, or why did you found that? That was, um, it was because I keep thinking I had challenging moment when I first start my career as an Asian Australian because of my accent, because I, you know, have different sense of humor. How do I build relationship differently? How I work differently. Back then when I first start my career as a placement student, I feel really like I blame myself a lot that I wanted to change myself to fit in. So I keep asking myself, did I do something wrong? Did I say something wrong? I did not get any nurturing from the team, from the organization. Because back then, cultural diversity and inclusion, it wasn't a topic in the forefront of people's, uh, I guess, head. So I keep thinking to myself, what can I do now to nurture the next generation of AAOP that I didn't have back then? That's why I talked to at the very beginning in 2019, I speak to 25 of AOPs, one-on-one -on -one coffee. I had a lot of coffee that year <laughs> for pandemic, lucky. Um, so I really interview them, like really get to know them. Is that only in my head that I feel challenged? Do you feel the same thing? Is that a need to formalize like a course to really work on that, to nurture us specifically? Um, yeah, so that's how I developed the AAOP. That's the story. Yeah, so I guess you had a lived experience of loneliness, yeah. um, you know, not feeling Absolutely. like you really fitted in. And so kind of AAOP and um, your Beyond Story company yeah. are, are really linked in terms of the mission, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's really about finding your personal power, no matter who you are, what demographics you, you have, what makeup you have, that you show up fully with yourself and have that confidence. Yeah, and, and to combat that loneliness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, interested in unpacking that further today. Mm. Mm. So can you take us through some of the statistics relating to loneliness? Sure. So in 2019, this is a statistic before pandemic. So one in four Australians are lonely. 37% of Australian employees are feeling lonely. So lonely Australians are 15.2% more likely to, to be depressed. Um, and research, this is the shocking fact to me research shows that loneliness has the same effect as 15 cigarettes a day in terms of healthcare outcomes and healthcare costs 15 cigarettes a day mm. i was shocked really by that figure is that more than a pack how many i don't know how pack? many in a pack well, you, show us a couple of day packs Marco, so like yeah, that's, that's, why, that's why I've got this well. voice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that is really shocking. And researchers have really found that chronic loneliness is associated with, you know, greater risk of heart disease, dementia, depression, anxiety, and also uh, shorter lifespan. Mm. Yeah, so these are very, like, I mean, quite negative and severe statistic there's no good news about loneliness let me put it that way yeah it's definitely one of those things I guess that had been I'd noticed it appearing in headlines um sort of in around 2019 all of this you know loneliness is bad for your health kind of stuff um 
So yeah, definitely um, interested to find out more about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So why do you feel the workplace is a good place to tackle and, and talk about loneliness? Because I've done so much research on this and research has really found that workplace is a very critical environmental determinant of loneliness. So environmental determinant, I think for for the audience of the podcast probably know what that means is our health, mental health doesn't only, like we don't only create it by ourselves. It's sometimes the environmental and social determinants will impact on how we feel, how we think and how we act. So workplace is a significant environmental determinant of loneliness because we always talk about meaningful work. We always talk about, you know, uh, building relationship with our work colleagues, team effectiveness, all that is relationship. And job design, everything is impacted on how we think and how we feel at work. So that's why workplace is actually really critical when it comes to um, uh, addressing loneliness. Yeah, it's really interesting, right? You'd think if you're surrounded by colleagues that you should feel a sense of connection or at least not feel lonely. But I guess from your own personal experience, you can be, you know, amongst many other peers and still not feel connected. Yeah, I think the connection is not necessarily related to physical presence of how many people, as you said, Jason, is really about the quality of that relationship. If in a meeting, I don't feel safe to even speak up. Mm. Who I am is not being seen. My talent is not being leveraged. It's not being valued. So in the first place, no matter how talented I am, if the environment is not leveraging that or letting me feel safe to show up as who I am, that's also loneliness. Yeah, that's really interesting because I know definitely from the field of positive psychology, they talk about it's not the amount of connections that you've got. So it doesn't matter how many Instagram followers or Facebook friends you've got. It's the quality of the connections that you've got that really matters for your mental health and and physical well-being, as you say, as well. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's the quality. Yeah. And I think from the uh, Harvard Grant study where, you know, that's the longest longitudinal study of adult development, Yeah, yeah. um, you know, they found that quality of relationships um, as a 50-year-old uh, was the best predictor of, of positive health outcomes, mental and physical, um, mm-hmm. by the time you're uh, in your 80s. So, um, yeah, like you say, it's it, it, it's about fostering the, the quality of the connections rather than just having lots of connections. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So, I yeah, I can remember, again, thinking back to some of the, um, the research re- reporting that I was reading around that time that it was sort of um, – there were some findings about like if you have one, even just one like best friend at work, um, that that would actually have a significant health benefit. Can you take us through any more of that research that's actually been done on, I guess, the relationship between work factors and loneliness? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the research to be very honest, is not very up to date, but there are research there because loneliness is a, is a very, I guess, complex and new topic that we only shy lights on it just recently because of the pandemic. There are many beforehand have, have, have done, but it's not really comprehensive, I have to say. Um, so typically what the research have looked at is look at how a person Builds themselves, for example, personal characteristics such as personality, emotional stability, in conjunction with their perception of the organization and the situation, such as social support, job characteristic like workload, organizational climate like team spirit, cultural fit. Um, do I feel anxious and fear when I show up in a meeting? So is look the research really looking at self and the interrelationship with that situation and the environment, if that makes sense? So that has been the focus. And hence also then look at the outcome. The outcome would be um, attitudes to work work. So loneliness is, 
you know, correlated with withdrawal attitudes, meaning the intention of turnover, lack of organizational commitment, and the perception of well-being, which include job stress, job satisfaction, and life satisfaction. So everything will be reduced. So that's pretty much a summary of all the research. And, and also there are research looking at loneliness reduce uh, increased burnout, loneliness reduce productivity, creativity, uh, definitely impact on retention. So these are all the, I guess, looking at different factors, internal factors with external factors, their, their interaction, and then the outcome. So are there any areas that I guess um, you'd like to see researchers focus on? Um, it's definitely more on job design. How we design a job that boosts connection. Mm. Now, this is a very big question um, because after pandemic, we are still in it somehow, um, how we work is very different. Hybrid workplaces, gig economy, um, why do we go to work? I think a lot of people reflect on that question. What do I want from this job? I think the pandemic really brings this, it's, it's dark night of the soul <laughs> to a lot of people thinking, why I do what I do? Why I work as a psychologist? Why I work as an engineer? Why? why? So I think that needs to, research needs to catch up with that is, is the job design. How do we design a job or workforce that boosts all this connection while part of the team work from home, while part of, you know, the work, workforce actually face-to-face? -face. How do we do that? Yeah. I mean, we, we talk a lot about the systemic or work design yeah. issues that influence, you know, mental health outcomes and loneliness is, is one of those. Um, so why, why do you think we do need to shift the focus to maybe work design and the systemic um, causes of loneliness versus the individual uh, contributors to loneliness? I think because... It's a very good question, Jason. Let me let me let me ponder it. I think it's because definitely how we used to understand psychology is very different from now. If that makes sense, what I just said is how we understand mental health conditions at work back then is very focusing on individual behaviors and is almost separate from how we design an organization. And if there is anything happened, oh, we have EAP. Mm. EAP is, is important still. We have EAP. We fill in uh, a program, a mindfulness program here and there, here and there. Isn't it that's enough? That's not enough. That's yeah. not enough. Um, and I think, um, Jason, you have shared your view on LinkedIn as well about, you know, mindfulness program and resilience program is important, but it's not a predictive approach to prevent someone getting unwell in their psychological condition. Um, that's why we need to start with job design. Mm. Um, environmental factor is the key for prevent someone when you think about it we, we need to shift to from reactive to preventative yeah certainly as we've covered extensively on this podcast the popular approaches to workplace mental health really focus on the individual um, and mental health is something they bring to work with them mm. rather than work actually having an influence on on their mental health um, and I guess the same could be said for loneliness and it's something that, you know, it's the individual's choice whether they're lonely or not. Um, we, I'm not sure we've spoken about it too much because, um, you know, one of the areas um, I really like looking into is positive psychology and we talk about PERMA, so the, the yeah. pillars of good mental health. So mm -hmm. having experiencing positive emotions regularly, uh, having high levels of engagement or experiencing flow, um, positive relationships, sense of meaning and, and, and purpose, uh, and that sense of accomplishment as well. And, and often we talk about how, you know, like nutrition, exercise and sleep, they can be primarily the uh, responsibility of the individual 
to develop and, and foster. But there's no reason to say that the organization couldn't, like through work design, foster high quality connections and, and positive relationships either. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and even something simple as, you know, teaching leaders how to practice active, constructive responding, for example, which is from the field of positive psychology, would be, um, you know, one of these uh, ways to address it, I guess, more systemically. Um, hmm. Joel's got nothing to add to that. <laughs> Just wondering if you finished with that thought. Yeah, no, I have. It yeah, like you were still pondering. No, no, no. So, you know, I, I, I definitely think, yeah, there, there is a role of the employer to, you know, for, to, to think about work design and how that either helps or hinders the development of, of higher quality relationships and, um, you know, reduce reduction of, of loneliness. Yeah. I, th- I mean, you could say the same for like meaningfulness and accomplishment as well. There's All you know, clear, them. there's yeah. clear roles for, um, for organizations there to, yeah. to contribute to those. Yeah. Yeah. All, all five, of, all yeah. five of the areas for sure. Uh, I mean, um, one of the things that we keep picking up at the moment um, or, or particularly during lockdown through our wellbeing check-in measure was that people want, when they were feeling lower in their wellbeing, isolated work was a contributing factor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's not that we just ignore it and say, well, everyone's remote. Like, we're just going to have to put up with it. It's like, well, what could we be doing that might make people feel more connected, even though we're working remotely? So, um, hmm. yeah, I think I think definitely we need to think about. Um, I think I mentioned it. Like people think about the why that they are doing, and after pandemic, I think it needs to have a space, a moment for the organization or across different teams to revisit why they do what they do reimagining the purpose and set very clear, even though you think, even though the team thinks that they know, it's actually really good to touch base on why exactly what we are doing is reimagining that purpose. And I've done it with organization like that whenever they decided to bring their workforce back to work, the first thing is the first week is to have that conversation. So we are back here now, we are a team. So why are we doing what we're doing? And then to set goals from there or to reset some of the goals or revisit and reinforce some of the goals. So everyone knows what they're doing and why they're doing it to enforce that meaning. And I was reading some research. Um, I'm happy to send it uh, afterwards and you can put the link um, Mm -hmm. for your audience. Um, I was reading this research because of the pandemic, because we were socially isolated for so long. Work, particularly those that really need that socialization, those individuals, they see work very differently from before. There is an identity building that needs to recreate at work. Like we used to have very clear boundary of this is work, this is home, this is work, this is home. Uh, we finish work, then we drive home or we go home. Now we don't, right? It's, it's almost merged. So a lot of the people see work now is a socialization thing. I miss my colleagues. I really want to see them. I really want to working together with them on something meaningful, right? And and so I'm not talking about all, I'm talking about some of them, and which is a large proportion population. So I've seen some research to, to really talked about how do we create a social identity that is shared across all employees? I think that's another thing. What does collaboration really look like? Is that only for work or for socializing? So those are the things that pretty much research hasn't really have the clear answer at this point uh, in terms of loneliness. So, yeah, so this is the, I forgot even your question, Jason, but just stop me from there. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, um, that's bang on. Um, it's interesting, like you say, it's not just about bringing a team together for um, a shared purpose around work, but it's also that shared social identity. So I yeah. thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, mm. I think also I think that the, the idea of shared purpose as well, um, you know, if you think about the relationships that we have um, because we choose to have them, um, 
with, you know, with friends and with not not people who are imposed on us through family, but people who we choose to have as our family. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of that is about about shared values and um, perspectives and and that sort of thing. So I think, yeah, there, there's something in that about you know in in the workplace actually what is it that we as an organization are aspiring yeah. to do um and that you know collectively we're working towards and that can sort of lend itself to having a better understanding of where we do have those values in common and that can potentially start to foster that that sense of community um yeah so not just shared um productivity outcomes but like how we live in the values what's, yeah what's, and, what's the, the greater reason impact yeah. why why do we yeah. do what we do yeah, yeah. Um, probably less um, less of an effective strategy for people who are literally only there for the paycheck. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so can you, do you have any practical suggestions for organisations of sort of um, job design or other strategies they can use to, to start to reduce loneliness? Yeah, I think think about for the role, um, do you actually really need someone to work on can you actually, can you reduce, can you hire two people for doing the same thing using same cost rather than one person doing the, the same thing for extensive period of time? It's shared job responsibility. I see that actually really worked um, in terms of to create a connection to people to share responsibility, to have that ideas bouncing rather than one person. And it creates flexibility for organization too. So this is actually one, but that may not work for all organization. I've seen it work for some. Um, and also there are things around psychological safety um, that is so critical is I don't think any organization can survive without a high level of understanding what psychological safety is now because we are quite vulnerable as a, as a human race right now. So if workplace, you expect everyone to show up with always positivity, it, it's not possible. So how do we show and, and like really help the team to be able to feel safe to ask questions uh, raise concern, admit mistakes, or offering the most unpopular ideas. How do we do that? And I think it comes down to very basic things, empathy and uh, compassion. I'm not talking about running a workshop. I'm talking about back to a human being um, to really allow, if, if you tend to question everything, is your default, maybe just be aware of your own behaviour when you show up at work because, you know, we our thinking is very slow right now. It's actually not as quick as before when you think about it with, with all this happening. So think about how you ask the questions, how you be very curious. Those are the very practical things that daily you can use. It doesn't need a training. I'm asking people to show up with curiosity, to really listen, to really allow people to show concern and you listened. Um, and when people are making mistakes, how do you actually help this person to really regain strength? Those, we used to call it soft skills, but it's not soft. It's, I hate that when people say, this is soft skills. It's not soft skills. It's, it's super powerful skills that can lift the other person up immediately. Um, yeah, so that's that's the practical advice. Is that practical enough? <laughs> I think that's that's really great because what you're talking about there are things that everybody can start to do straight away. You know, we, and it doesn't it doesn't need budget. It doesn't need you know top management approval. It's not a strategic initiative or anything like that. It's literally just changing making a mindfully changing the way that you're interacting with with people at work every day yeah you don't need a workshop or training jason's laughing at me because <laughs> i use the word mindful <laughs> no, how, how you said it <laughs> not what you said <laughs> 
and listeners will have to watch the video for that one. So they might have heard the inflection. <laughs> <laughs> My fault. So, um, Christine, what, what are the benefits then um, for a workplace in tackling loneliness? Um, it's very it's very interesting because I just said you don't need to spend any program, um, do any program on it. But actually, there are research actually looking at if you invest a dollar in any program that treat loneliness, meaning to helping people to optimize the relationship, organization return on investment is three times triple so that's that's any pro any program uh any program that of course have i, I got a program oh. for you christine like let me <laughs> <laughs> um so program treating loneliness is really about building optimizing your personal psychological fitness and team fitness to connect that's yeah, so, that's so it'd have to be an evidence informed evidence, not, yeah. not not just hey, we've stocked the fridge with beers, everybody. No, that'd be pretty good. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it works for us. <laughs> or, or yeah, we just put in more uh, team building exercise or activity, and not not that. Mm. So it has to be evidence based at the right time with the right interval. And you know what I'm talking about but with the right interval mm. and with measurement and all that. Um, yeah, so it's triple the return on investment. Yeah, so is there plenty of literature which talks about what makes for a good um, program in the workplace to tackle loneliness? I have to say not many of those. Uh, the research on intervention in loneliness is a lot around building social skills, um, those are very outdated, I have to say, outdated research out there. Um, but yeah, that actually not many, but the related research is actually looking at, um, as you already mentioned, Jason, it's about positive psychology with wellness. Those are highly correlated with the reduction of loneliness. Um, so I'm talking about anecdotally because research is really not that updated. That's my but honest opinion. Yeah. For any aspiring PhD students out there, it's a, probably a good do one it. to tackle. Yeah. Yeah. Do it, please. So, so we'd be <laughs> taking a principles-informed approach rather than an evidence-informed approach at this stage. At the moment, it yeah. sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, so can you share us um, a case study or an example Um where you've seen an organisation that's been able to have a, a positive impact on loneliness? I have seen not an organisational intervention. I have seen, I have coached executive before and, and this person feel extremely lonely and I've coached this person. Um, so I can talk about what does that look like? Um, uh, how do we know that this person is lonely, but, you know, it's not something else? Um, so I think it's three years ago, I worked with this gentleman um, and he's this senior partner, I work in a large consulting organisation. Um, the job is his dream job. He described it, dream job, surrounded by very clever, funny, like-minded people. It's really, he feels privileged to be in that job. So he's not unhappy about the job, okay? So, but then he noticing every morning he, like, he noticing there is a behavior that he woke up in the morning, he's supposed to get dressed to work, but he didn't. He's staring at the ceiling for an hour for a few weeks. And he doesn't know what that was. Um, and then after a few sessions, then we discovered that he feels very much afraid to go out with his team because they are all younger. He is uh, like, he's like mature aged uh, senior manager and he didn't want to ask them because he wasn't invited. See, because he's more senior, 
he's not younger. He, you know, is is he see himself? He, his inner narrative is I'm. I don't want to ask them because I don't want to be seen as an embarrassing old person to hang out with young kids. That's why I didn't ask. But that's see, that's the sh- connection that he just missed. He show up at work. He love his job, but he feels so isolated. He still make decision, but he feels so isolated and that he couldn't build connection with the team. He wanted to, but he just feel if this inner narrative saying, I don't fit that group. Um, they don't want a senior manager to be there. And he wasn't invited. And it turns out he dragged going to work. He doesn't want to go out to work. Um, and he has this narrative that, well, I'm old. Like, this is very strong. I'm old. What, what can I offer to young people? So he isolates himself and more and more. This is the patterns of loneliness. So he will then start looking at the world as everything, all the evidence is, all the reason that he isolates himself more, if that makes sense. Uh, there is no one at work that he can talk about his pressure with more senior people, (laughs) no one he can share, even peer level, no one. Like he can't talk about, you know, um, the extreme pressure he was in uh, and definitely not downward. So you got to be, it's very lonely. And I have heard many executives talked about this. Leader is very lonely because it's like, well, who, who do you want to hang out with for senior leaders after work? <laughs> Remember when I was younger, first start? I don't want my boss to come to drink. <laughs> We're going to talk about him. That's it. That's it. Who, who, wants, who wants to hang out with the boss? People people with upwards aspirations. That's yeah. who wants to hang I out with the boss. That's what I was thinking. But yeah. if you want to have a bitch about the boss, well, then you don't it. want the boss there. No, you don't no. want a boss there. Yes. Yeah. So, so what, what strategies did you did you recommend? I think because it's one-on-one coaching, there were a lot of acceptance and commitment therapy to understand his, to make him realize his own narrative. Um, it is, is like to really separate and diffuse that uh, rather than he he is he is old. That is so strong, and then how that comes about limiting beliefs and all that. So it's a one-on-one coaching session with him and then he then noticed that is the way that he sees the world so is to regain that I guess um reframe that in a narrative and the the way that he think he's not giving there is nothing that he can offer that is very strong well I said you have got wisdom you have got lived experience and you're fun I, I actually, it's very interesting that how we see ourselves is just so different from how other people see us. That we, we need to do reality checks sometimes. Sometimes it's opposite. Sometimes we think we are that good, but it's actually you're not <laughs> that good. <laughs> but sometimes... <coughs> Jason. Have, yeah. Oh, so what do you mean? That's you're a bad Jason. cough you got there, Joel. Do you want a glass of water? <laughs> I've got some, thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry. So a lot of um, with him, I use a lot of um, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy to work on the inner narrative to help him to reconnect with who he is, and then to work on strategy of speed, bit by bit to have the confidence to invite himself to go for drinks. It's all in his perception. It's not accurate. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I, of course, you use uh, leadership assessment and 360 to use it as a tool to really see his reality, his leadership reality. Yeah, so I can see how the, the 360 would, would be helpful yeah. in, that, mm. um, in yeah. that kind of a situation where if he's, um, his view of how um, his team sees him is, yeah. you know, and there's a big gap between his perception and actually what, what they're saying themselves, then that kind of a process would be really helpful. Yeah, and 
I, I think I kind of used that uh, process, the 360 process, to guide him through to make him see is actually nothing like that. I purposely, um, the 360 assessment, I actually add another activity for him, is for him to ask them directly. Like after doing the 360, but I ask him, can you ask your team these questions? I want to be this kind of leaders. How do I show up? And can you give, please give me a rating? It's a very like um, daunting exercise, mm -hmm. but he did it. And once he hear what the young people feedback, he told me, it's actually, I'm not that bad. Like, I'm like, who tells you what that bad? So it's, it's through this interaction, he rebuilt a confidence in himself and with the people. And he realized it's all in his mind. It's all in his mind. Yeah. Well, that, was a, that was a fantastic um, case study. That was, yeah, not, not what I was expecting at all, but it was, it was a wonderful story. Thank you, Christine. Yeah. No, it, yeah. It's great that uh, there's people like you that provide that, I guess, professional coaching uh, to, mm -hmm. to leaders um, who need, you know, some assistance in that area. Are you lonely, Jason? I've got you, you can talk to me. Uh, how could I be lonely? I don't know. Yeah. I'm the best. You are pretty good. <laughs> Just ask you. Um, okay, so, Christine, it's been a fantastic conversation around loneliness. First time we've really tackled that in, on this podcast. Um, clearly, you've got a bit of experience now um, and I guess – you've got a real niche that, that you're working in. Um, yeah. So if you were to think about though, the, the future of workplace mental health more broadly, um, what would your hopes or aspirations be? I definitely think is to take a proactive approach. I have mentioned this, um, is to take a proactive approach to thinking about job design and how you build an environment that flourish <laughs> um, every employee at work rather than, oh, you are stressed. You should go to EAP. Like it's good at that end for crisis management is great, but not upfront. We, we need to do better in, in, in that space is to get data to help us to prevent um, mental health conditions at work. Yeah, yeah, that's my hope. Yeah, yeah. Well, and hope, hopefully, uh, everyone's listening to that. We want to focus on work design and and how we can improve the psychosocial working conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, do you have any words of advice for listeners who are sort of thinking about um, working in this field? Is challenging, but extremely rewarding. Um, if you care about people, if you love data, like this is the space that is your heaven. I love data. I love people. Um, I loved it. Like that's why I stay in here still <laughs> sticking around. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think both of you would agree is, is like we don't just talk about people only anecdotally with one off story we is a science so if you like I think a lot of my friends who is a doctor and lawyers they misunderstand what we do is actually highly scientific and evidence-based um, so yeah highly rewarding challenging um, and if you want intellectual stimulation this is the area that you need to get into we don't have enough talent in this space i think yeah i think i did i did just did a promotion we did us justice that's good <laughs> you did you did do us justice christine thank you yeah it's a pretty good profession yeah uh christine that's been a fantastic conversation as i said um and that brings us to the end of the episode so thank you so much for joining us thank you for having me see i enjoy this so much so much fun yeah, it's good. Yeah, we'll have you on our other podcast soon. What what do we call it again, Joel? Um, oh, oh psycholo podcast? psychologists are people, are people too. too. Yeah, yeah, people. yeah, no, yeah. Look out for that coming from Flourish TX now. <laughs> Maybe better not put it under the Flourish TX banner. We don't want to associate it with that. No, no, no. <laughs>
<laughs> there'll be an after dark special. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks again, Christine. So listeners, um, that brings us to the end of the episode. Hopefully you found that uh, really enjoyable. Uh, actually, Christine, before you um, go out, where can people find out more about your work and um, that a beyond story? So I'm on LinkedIn. So Christine Young, Y-E-U-N-G, my last name. Um, Beyond Story website, www.beyondstory.com.au. You will find me there and LinkedIn would be the easiest to connect. Yeah, terrific. So um, we uh, do video these listeners over our Zoom conversations that we have with people. So you would have seen some great facial expressions if you watched the video rather than listen to the audio today from uh, Joelle. Um, if you can, you, you can check that out. We will put some short clips up on the Flourish DX LinkedIn page as well. And while you're over on LinkedIn, as Christine said, you know, feel free to reach out to her. Feel free to reach out to Joelle and myself. We love to continue the conversation on that medium. Um, and that is it. I'm pretty sure. So catch you next episode.